have happened in the past and are going to happen in the future that are going to change potentially the way we do business when we're dealing with commissions. And that's the whole reason we're in the business, right, is to get a paycheck. Um, and that's our commission check. So we're going to go through the topics today. We're going to talk about these lawsuits that are out there. Look at some buyer broker agreements, what they're all about, the benefits of them, the value of a realtor, because this piece, your value and what you bring to the transaction and to the whole process is what is going to help you and talking to buyers about signing a buyer broker agreement. And it's something that's pushed by National Association of Realtors and Florida Association of Realtors for you to talk about your value. And we'll get into that when we get to that section. We have some scripts for if you are sitting down with a buyer and you're not sure kind of what to say, here's some scripts, some ideas, and then what to do now. Because we are at sort of the beginning of this whole change in our, the way we'll probably be do, doing business here in Florida in particular. Now, a lot of states already have buyer broker agreements and it's just common practice. You sit down as a buyer's agent, you give a buyer broker agreement, no big deal, nobody asks questions, we're good to go. But it's not common here in Florida. There are some realtors that I know that use them. And when I've been doing these classes, they've actually given me some ideas too, or given other real estate agents ideas on sort of how to broach the subject, or they just hand the buyer broker agreement over and say, this is what we do. And our job is to really educate the consumer. So let's start off with what these lawsuits are about. So there's two big lawsuits against National Association of Realtors and then some of the large, larger brokerage firms like Keller Williams, et cetera. Um, you've got Burnett versus NAR, and that was a Missouri class action suit. So it was just based in Missouri. And then we have a national one, it's Moral et al., which means there's a lot of plaintiffs because it's a huge class action. And that's a national lawsuit. And that's against the National Association of Realtors and then the large brokerage firms. The Burnett case was decided in October in favor of the plaintiffs. And both cases, the plaintiffs are arguing the same thing. They want to change the longstanding practice of home sellers paying for the commissions for both the buyer and the listing agents through the proceeds of the sale. So the current practice is the seller pays the commissions for both. But what the sellers are saying and these plaintiffs and why they filed a lawsuit is like, why am I responsible to pay for the buyer's agent? I'm paying for my listing agent to list my property. The buyer should be paying for the buyer's agent to do their job and to show the homes, et cetera. And there are some other things involved too with antitrust, which we'll get into as well, but that's the gist of it. Both of these lawsuits are from the plaintiffs that were the home sellers that are arguing that they should not be responsible for paying for the buyer's commission. Oops. So, they further talk about how it's an antitrust violation because the fees are inflated to pay for the buyer's agents by requiring a listing agent to compensate a buyer's agent for listing a property on the MLS. So kind of the idea behind that was if I'm a seller and I only want to give the buyer's agent 1%, so it's listed on the MLS, you know, I'm paying 3% for my listing agent, I'll pay 1% for the buyer's agent. My home is probably not going to be shown by commission amount for the buyer's agent to draw them to my home so that they'll come look at my home. So it felt like on the seller side that if you weren't paying the full commission amount, your house wasn't going to get shown. And that's their argument, sort of the basis of it. And that's an antitrust violation. An antitrust is really to protect consumers from unfair business practice, from inflated fees, um, and to promote competition in business. 
So these both these lawsuits are antitrust violation lawsuits. And they're, like I said, class action. There's a lot of plaintiffs involved. The one in Missouri was decided in favor of the plaintiffs back in October. And we're talking, these are like, I think that one was like $1.8 billion the in settlement. And the one, the national one is something like $13 billion. These are very high end expensive lawsuits because the sellers don't want to pay the buyer's commission. Now, it was decided in favor of the plaintiffs in Missouri. The national case has not gone to court yet. Uh, It was supposed to go to court actually in February, but it's going to be a long time. There's a lot of parties involved. National Association of Realtors is fighting it. You know, we've had a lot of the big brokerage firms actually settle because they don't want to go to court. So it's being played out, but know that Also, the one that was decided in October in Missouri is being appealed by National Association of Realtors. So the appeal process, this whole court process can take a couple years. However, National Association of Realtors, Florida Association of Realtors, all the other association of realtors in every other state is saying now is the time to start thinking about changing our business practices where we use buyer broker agreements and really the benefits of them and all of that. So here's the potential results. And this is why we're having these conversations. If these lawsuits are both decided in favor of the plaintiffs and the National Association of Realtors loses in their appeals, then these are some things that could happen. Agent compensation will fundamentally change. Potential home buyers may have to negotiate and pay commissions either up front or they're going to have to pay commissions to their agents. It's going to adversely affect all first time home buyers and increase an already large racial disparity for home ownership. Why? Because you have to bring in additional money now to close. And currently, if I'm getting a loan as a home buyer, Commissions aren't included in those loan costs, so they're not rolled into the loan. So it's going to be a separate amount. And right now, lenders aren't, they're like, yeah, you'd have to bring that in on your own buyer. Now, keep in mind, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who underwrite uh, over 50% of the loans in the United States, they want to change the practice where that commission may be included in the loan um, and the loan costs so that it would get rolled into the loan, make it easier for the buyers. But that is not the case right now. That is something they're working on. So their concern with the potential results is now you've got a buyer, first time, first time home buyer in particular, who's probably looking at, you know, having a hard time doing an 80, 20 loan to value anyway. And they're thinking I can afford a $250,000 house. I'll get a mortgage for, you know, to 20 or whatever, but now I have to bring an additional six, 3% to pay for my buyer's agent and I don't have that money. So we might see a dip in that. Now, these are all potential results. These aren't necessarily probable. That doesn't mean it's going to happen, but these are, are things we have to take into consideration now. Or buyers could be forced to go through the most important and complex purchase of their lifetime without the advice and counsel from a trusted professional because they're not going to hire a real estate agent. They're just going to go online, negotiate maybe with the listing agent or the homeowner and go through the process on their own. And that is going to play into your value as a real estate agent, which we'll get to. Now, another concern is there's going to be a drop in commission to an average of 2% for each broker, which would immediately push about 40% or more of existing realtors out of the business. Now, once again, this isn't happening tomorrow. This may never happen, but all potential results from these lawsuits, if they're all decided in favor of the seller, the plaintiff, or the seller is not going to pay the commission, you're going to see you know, the uphill battle to maybe get a commission if you're a buyer's agent. Now, the use of buyer broker agreements is what's going to save us. So um, because of the lawsuit, so Burnett and all of that, 
National Association of Realtors has on their website, and they have the link here. And yes, I will be sending this presentation to Judy. So you have it and have all the information and all the links. But questions on their site are like, well, what do we do now? Because of the Burnett lawsuit that was uh, decided in favor of the plaintiffs where the sellers don't have to pay commission. So National Association of Realtors says, hey, you know, let's not stress about it, but we need to start thinking about if this is going to be the new norm, how are we going to handle it? So let's take care of it now. So they said, they've always emphasized for years, two important things. One is the use of buyer representation agreements or buyer broker agreements. And the second for members, real estate members, to continue to express that commissions are negotiable and set between brokers and their clients, to explain how local MLS broker marketplaces promote equity, transparency, and market-driven pricing for consumers, and persistently communicate the incredible value agents who our realtors provide. So National Association of Realtors has always talked about buyer broker agreements. You have the listing agreement with the seller, buyers should have an agreement with you as the real estate agent. And this is these are some of the talking points. So how do you protect yourselves? The buyer broker agreements. So benefits of these agreements are going to be maximizing the transparency by putting agreements in writing. And if you know me, and I think many of you have been on some classes before, that I am a stickler for getting things in writing. You have a phone conversation with somebody, you put it in an email, you send it to your client, you say, confirm this is what we talked about. All of that is potential evidence and protection for you if you ever have to go to court. And it's the same thing here. When you are having a discussion with your buyer about them using you exclusively, it's like, well, this is what I'm going to do. So it formalizes the working relationship between the parties, says what you're going to do to earn your commission. But also it's going to say what the buyer is going to do because the buyer has responsibilities and obligations as well to get the transaction closed and to follow certain rules. And that's all it is. It's saying, I'm the realtor going to do this, buyer, you're going to do this. For, uh, as a, a payment of my services, I'll get a commission when it closes. That's a buyer broker agreement, and it's a formalized agreement. It's also a legally binding agreement. It's a contract between the both parties. Now, it's not a unilateral contract where the Real estate agents like I'm going to do all this, and you know, buyer will close and you pay me commission. No, buyer still has things to do. So it is like any contract, like our purchase agreement. The buyer has to do things, seller has to do things. If one party doesn't do what they're supposed to do per the contract, they breached the contract, and now you have a legal remedy. Other things, the benefits of this are they provide or they build trust by promoting transparency through upfront conversations. You're laying out everything you're going to do. You're going to see what the pitfalls are, all of that, and address them in this buyer broker agreement. Talks about your services and the compensation for those services. And then it also ensures consumer protection and builds strong relationships with buyers. You have your buyer's best interest at heart. You are their you know, you have their back. That's the idea behind a buyer broker agreement. Now, I've done this class before and I've had um, real estate agents that use these already. You know, if they ever get any sort of pushback from a buyer, their usual conversation is, well, here's the thing, buyer. You can talk to six different real estate agents, look at a hundred different homes and then pick a real estate agent. You know, you can be as carefree and loose as you want in my relationship or your relationship with me. And, you know, I can show you a bunch of homes and you take a home I showed you and you go to another real estate agent and close with them. So you have that luxury, but know that buyer if we don't have this agreement where I'm going to commit 100% to you and you're committing 100% to me, then I'm going to be kind of the loosey goosey with you. I'm going to, you know, not give it my all, not maybe you'll always have their best interest, but you know, there's got to be that 
I'm working for you and I'm working for you exclusively and I'm going to give it my all and you're going to compensate me for my time. So it builds that sort of consumer confidence. Now, like I said, these aren't that popular here in Florida. Um, I had a friend, another a real estate agent here in Florida who was buying property in North Carolina and she sat down at, at, with the real estate agent in North Carolina and they literally just handed over the buyer broker agreement. And she's like, what's this? They're like, it's a buyer broker agreement. And she said, well, uh, we don't have these in Florida. Like, yeah, this is what we do in North Carolina. She didn't even question it. She just signed it. So these are the kinds of things we have to change that practice here in Florida. And they're really not a scary thing. Why are these agreements even important using right now is because of the procuring cause doctrine. So the procuring cause doctrine says that whoever the procuring causes of the sale or the executed lease and it's through their outreach and actions results in that sale or lease is the one that's entitled to the commission and there are a lot of situations especially here in florida where buyer broker agreements are not used frequently or at all where i just talked about that situation a buyer goes online they find some homes, they call a couple different real estate agents, they look at a bunch of homes with those real estate agents, they find one they like, but then they call their cousin who's a realtor and say, hey, can you drop the contract? I found this home and sort of steal it right from under this other realtor that spent their time and energy showing them homes because the, there's no agreement. Buyer can do that. And in those kinds of things, you'll have the real estate agent that showed the property and maybe did some stuff with the buyer, but the buyer uses another realtor to close. Who's the procuring cause? Who gets the commission? And that's where we see the fights over that. The buyer broker agreement is going to say, I did this, I showed you these homes, I get the commission and there's no question about it. And like I said, there's I every time I do these classes, every at least 60% of the real estate agents there raise their hand. They're like, yeah, I've had this. I'm in a dispute right now because I did all of these steps. And then basically the contract was stolen from me and given to another realtor who closed it. And I feel like I did all the work and I should get paid for it. Now, Procuring cause, you go to arbitration, and it's there is um, a bunch of different elements. It's not just the party that showed you the house. It's the outreach. It's like I said, all of these, there's just a lot of things, and it's a case-by-case -case basis. So that's why it's really important to document everything you've done, every conversation. Because if you ever get in a situation as a buyer's agent where you're competing for your commission, and you feel like you've done a lot, you're going to have to prove it in front of the arbitration committee to see if you get that commission. That's the procuring cause. With a buyer broker agreement, you don't have a procuring cause issue because it's an exclusive agreement. So what are the goals of having this agreement? Promoting that mutually beneficial relationship, explaining the agent's role and serving the customer in a transaction, proving that the agency has the customer's best interest at heart. Remember, I'm going to bat for you. I'm 100% on your side. I'm there to get you through to the finish line. Without this agreement, you you can go on your merry way, but so can I. It's a charter of the services the agent's going to provide to the customer, spells out which party will compensate the real estate agent and by how much, and there's key points for every contract. Now, the Florida Association of Realtors on their forms library has several different buyer broker agreements, actually a few different types of agreements that you can use. But if you were going to go to a real estate attorney or another attorney to have one drawn up, you want to make sure that there, these three aspects are covered. The first one is legal aspects, what the agent can do by law what the agent can't do by law, right? We have the unauthorized practice of law. There's certain things you cannot do as a real estate agent. We wanna list those all out so your buyer has 
a clear understanding of what you can and cannot do legally. Operational aspects, what your business routine is, the role and scope of the services you're going to provide, what you're responsible for. Then also what the buyer's role is in helping get to the, you know, the closing. We have due diligence. We have, you know, timelines for um, uh, like getting loan approval, inspections, all of that. That's on the buyer. And you want to you want to mandate those to sign the agreement. Just some ideas. And here's the link for this real estate trainer dot com that um, they have a wide variety of scripts. But I just like throwing those up there because it is. What do I say? You know, if somebody has an objection, well, you know, what is your concern with signing this? Because I we like them signed because I'm committing to you. And I'm committing to you for the 60 days to find you what you need and want. And in return, you're committing to me to pay me my commission. Some ideas to help as we change the conversation here in Florida to these becoming the norm. Um, engaging with prospective customers, encouraging them to visit your office to see the professional environment, how you kind of work things, see what other real estate agents are kind of up to. Um, responding to questions, taking time to respond, even if it's trivial, even if you think the question's silly. I will tell you, I bought my house 10 years ago. The closing process 10 years ago is totally different than what it is now. I mean, yes, title company, blah, 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 but the paperwork, the documents, there's new laws, all of that. I would be looking to a real estate agent to tell me, like, this is what this and this and this is. Yes, I'm in the field. Yes, I understand that. But it's still like if you're sitting down, I don't know some of these new things that are, I mean, that you would know more like about inspections or something like that. That's your role. So make sure that you are answering these questions. Um, there is no stupid question. The more you're willing to able to help somebody and help explain the process, the more you ha have added value to them. Uh, build up that necessary comfort level. Use that opportunity to gauge your prospects, asking meaningful questions to ascertain their true motives. Ask the question, you know, what is your timeline? Why are you looking to move? Why are you looking to buy? Qualify them. Because if you're spending your time with someone that's really not that interested or is using another real estate agent, you are wasting your time and energies. And by the way, always i don't care you sit down you start talking to a buyer your first question is are you working with another real estate agent do you have an agreement signed because if they have an exclusive agreement signed with another real estate agent and you start showing them homes you have an ethics code violation you cannot do that so Always ask, because even if they're like, yeah, I've been talking to a couple of realtors. Okay, have they shown you any homes? Are you anywhere in the process? Qualify your buyers. 95% of people go online and look at homes and then start shopping for a realtor. And they'll look, talk to several realtors. Buyers don't understand, most buyers, I should say, they don't understand that you know they should be committed to one real estate agent to help them. If it doesn't work out, great. 30 days, you move on. Give them the out. Those are the things that, you know, you want to take into consideration. Otherwise, they're just going to pick whoever they want. For now, you want to continue to express that commissions are negotiable and set between the broker and their clients. You want to explain how that local MLS broker marketplace promotes equity, transparency, and market-driven pricing for consumers. You want to persistently communicate the incredible value agents who our realtors provide. So this is from Florida Realtors, their news article. Go on their site too. They have a lot of info that you can use at your disposal to help you have these conversations. Because you want to remember something. Your time is just as important as the consumers. You're investing time to get them to sign in the dotted line, and that's worthy of compensation. 
And these buyer broker agreements are the best measure of the value of your time and the recognition it deserves. Final thought, you aren't compensated for selling a home. You're compensated for your knowledge and all aspects involved in getting that home sold. Period. That's whether you're on the listing side or the buyer side. You deserve to be compensated for your time. So that's the buyer broker agreements in a nutshell. Um, what do we have here? Judy has a 